<laughs> Going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we're going to be doing a really fun one. We're doing dovetails, but this time we're going to be doing angled. They actually go together at a 45 degree angle because I'm going to be making an octagonal box and I want to do it with dovetails. Uh, so I figured rather than doing one for the video, I'm going to do one for the live as well. So um, just like a regular dovetail, uh, except for rather than being at 90 degrees, it's at something other than 90 degrees. Uh, we have a lot of fun in that. If you are new to the uh, Wood by Right Lives, then uh, welcome. Uh, those of you who are live, you can put comments and questions down in the chat, and we will answer questions occasionally throughout. If you are watching this recorded, then you can go down in the description down below, and you will see a list of all of the questions that have been asked, as well as timestamps that will get you roughly to where they are in the video, uh, so you can read through those and bounce through it. This one will probably be the full hour long of the, the build on it. Um, each one of these dovetails takes me about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, which usually means a solid hour of live. Um, so we're going to be having a good bit of fun with that. Um, trying to think if there's anything I need. Um, oh, there is a, um, a, a local event coming up in Milwaukee. Uh, and this is um, the end of February. I want to say it's like February 21st. It's something right around the end. Um, and so it was just remember. sent out the invitations to the MWTCA members. So if you are wanting to come to that, um, I'm really looking forward to meeting a few of you and uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting these tool shows up and running again. Uh, so yes, very excited. <laughs> okay, um, dovetails. So the first thing we have to understand is that 90 degree dovetails seem well, dovetails naturally seem difficult, but 90 degrees seem to be easier. The thing you have to understand is it doesn't matter what angle it is, it's still the exact same joint. The only difference is the tool you use to measure it. The nice thing with a standard dovetail is that you're going to use the square to go this way, and you're going to use the square to go this way, and you're going to use the square to go this way. It's the same tool to mark them all out. The problem is, once you angle it, well, now you need the square to still go across the board, but the square won't do anything this way because it's no longer at an angle. And for that, you need a bevel gauge. And a bevel gauge is a square that is at an angle. So once you lock the bevel gauge down to the angle you need to cut your dovetails at, well, then this becomes your square that you put on in this direction. And this becomes the square that you put on in this direction. And that's really the only difference is that you have to use two different measurements for the two different angles that the dovetails are on. Now that's for a, a uh, um, you know, angled dovetail. It's still in, it's still, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Coplanar with the, oop. They're still in the same plane this way. But if you were to do a compound angled dovetail where they actually splay out, as well, um, then you have to have a third that's set up to the third dimension. Uh, but even then, it's the exact same thing. You just have to remember to use the right angle on the correct side. So once you wrap your brain around that, they become very simple and fairly straightforward. Uh, now I'm making an octagonal box, and so that means mine are all going together at uh, 45 degrees, or 45 degrees off of 90. So it's actually 100. And 135 degrees. <laughs> um, the other thing that really gets confusing for a lot of people is if you've got the two blocks. Here, let me grab. Where is my other one? It's the one that fell on the floor, wasn't it? Yeah, all the way down underneath the bench. I always fly into the invisible hole. Um, so I've got my two, and tonight I'm doing three and three. We're putting these two together. Um, it's one of these things that is a bit confusing. Let me get this on focus and switch over, is once you put these together, your assumption is always that the, the, the sharp corner is what goes on the outside of the box, but it's not. The sharp corner is actually the inside of the box, and they have to go in this way because they have to pass each other. Uh, so that gets a little bit confusing, is that they don't, they don't go together this way like you would, you would think about with a miter. They actually go together this way, and so they slide into each other like that. Um, and so that can be a, a bit confusing, um, but once you wrap your brain around it, it it's okay. So those are the, the two big things to think about. Um, so I'm using um, some white oak. This is actually 
um, at least a hundred year old quarter sawn white oak. I pulled it out of a dresser that was made somewhere around 1910. Uh, not a dresser, it was a desk. Um, it was really beat up, but I'm having fun with it. Um, now, first thing we have to do is if we were making this square, we would put this in a shooting board and shoot the end square, 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 square. Um, and we could do the same thing with this, and I could actually put it in my donkey ear, which holds it at 45 degrees, put it in the shooting board and shoot it down. But I actually prefer to do it freehand. Uh, I, I know, uh, odd, but I like to do things the hard way. Uh, so I'm actually going to put that in the vise over here and clamp it down. You got any questions while I'm doing this up? Mm -mm. No questions yet? Oh, cool. No, but if, when you pulled it apart, I the one side I was like, huh, that'd be an interesting design for a comb. <laughs> a comb? Yeah, because it has little finger slit things. It oh, made me I, think I, of I a see. comb. I know, you don't know what a comb <laughs> is, but for the rest of us with hair. <laughs> um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to lay out my lines around it. On the faces, I mark it with a square. And then on the edges, I'm actually going to mark it with a miter square or an unsquare. And this is going to be at 45 degrees. So on the edges, anything that's going on the edge, I'm going to be using this to mark it. Anything that's going to be on the face, I'm going to use this to mark it. So I'm going to put a mark here, run around it. Once my board, once I have my mark on there, I'm actually going to put it in the vise at an angle and cut roughly to it. I'm going to stay a little way from the way from the line, but I'm just going to cut it. Um, I don't need it to be perfect. I just want to get close to it. Then I'm going to grab a plane, come on over here. I didn't. And I have it chucked up in the vise with it at a matching angle. Actually, I'm going to do it this way. It'll push towards you. So the angle is now close to flat with the bench. I'm going to lock it down so it doesn't move in. And I'm just going to freehand it. It's a bit of a mess, so it's hitting in a few places and not in others because I quickly cut it up. And I've got the lines on here that I want to make sure I'm close to. I need to take a little bit more off of this side. Getting down close to getting through all the saw cuts. There we go. Now I'm going to bring this in and I'm going to check it. And a bit high on the back here. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, that's closer. A couple more passes and we should be good. So I have a question while you're doing that. What's that? So poor man wants to know, are these dovetails done upside down? Upside down. I'm just asking the question. Don't know what you mean by that. They're done just like any dovetails are. So yeah, I don't know what you mean by upside down. So uh, now we got a nice clean surface all the way across that way. The one thing we also want to make sure is that we're square this way. In that case, I need to bring this out. I can put it on here. I can check across, and here I've got a little bit of schmutz here i got to get rid of still. So I'm going to do one more pass. Should have gotten rid of it. And that's what I'm looking for. It's square this way, and it's 45 degrees this way. There's our edge that we want to work with. Now on all of these, I actually have them all marked out. Um, with the, the markings. I don't know if you can read it because it's on pin um, on the blue there. So I have three and four. That means that three goes to three and four connects to four. And there's also an arrow on there pointing up so I know which side is the top of the box. And these are all on the inside of the box because they go together this way. So now I'm going to cut my tails in this one because this one's going to have pins. It's going to have pins on both end, either end. This one will have tails on either end. And so as I go around the box Every other board will be a, tin, a pin board and a tail board, so there'll be um, there'll be four of each. Um, I have thought about doing a pentagonal box, which would be kind of fun. And in that case, you'd either have one board that would have pins and tails, or you would have them each reversing so that each board has pins on one end and tails on the other, and the whole thing kind of comes together as a, a zigzag. Um, maybe one day I'll do that. Okay, I have some clarification. What's that? So apartment said right, but the edge thing. It goes inside of outside, so wouldn't that be upside down? Uh, well, it can go either way. I mean, assuming that the two faces of the board are parallel, 
Um, you can put it on this way or you can put it on this way. Um, it doesn't really matter because they're both the same or they should be. If these two faces aren't parallel, if one of them is out, then you have to go off of one. Now, normally you would have one of these two sides marked as your reference face, in which case then you would always measure off of that, whether it's this way or this way. Um, but in this case, they're so close and the measurement, it's not gonna make any difference. Um, if they're visually parallel, they're parallel enough. I'm having the dropsies today. Hey, what was I working on? Number three. So we're gonna start off with the tails. Now the first thing we would normally do is I'd grab my marking gauge and I'd set up my marking gauge to the thickness of the board. And I'd set this on here and find out what the thickness of the board is and then I could mark off the ends. The problem is I can't do that with this because, well, it's at an angle. And in this case, I actually like to use reality, just kind of how I do with regular squares. I'll set this on here and I'll use a marking gauge I am having the dropsies today. <laughs> here, let me show you this. So normally I would set this on here and I grab my marking gauge and I would mark it and I'd mark the thickness of this board on the end board here. And that would be my stop gauge mark line. But in this case, I need the three and the three to go together. I'm gonna put them together like this. Actually, I'm gonna do it a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to grab my hold fast. There it is. Put my hold fast down here. Grab my hammer. Now let's turn this up a little bit more so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. And then I can put this board on here and I can mark it. I'll do the next one flipped around so you guys can actually see. Oop. And then that will give me a line that I can go to. Here, I'll do it. Come on, out. I'm going to turn my body around. I'm going to do it around this way. Three. Um, except for I need to do, I need to do this mark. So that means I need it turned this way because I need to do that mark. Bring that back out. So I have to do it four different ways. So on this one, this is the hardest one because I got to be on the inside here. That's why it's nice to have a long knife with a good reference face on here. I can set this on here and then go light, medium, come around from the other side. And that will give me my depth of cut line that I can cut down to there. Just gonna make it a little bit darker on this side because I want to be able to see it. There we go. You're not gonna be able to see it on the camera, but there's a line going right down there. And that's how far I'm gonna cut down to it. Then I need to do it on the other one. Um, and on one of these, on the tail board, I'm actually gonna make a line across there. I'll show you that when I get there. So let's do, flip it around and do the other side. Any questions thus far? Yes, I have a couple. Um, hang on. Which side is three, that side, what do we got? So there's two that go kinda hand in hand and it's, um, Let's see, who asked? Michael Dean and Peter DeWitt. Um, have you used, okay, are the pins and tails laid out here the same as you used for my step stool? Yes, so okay. it's the same, the same method, it's just different angle. And then is it the same thing that you used? I know you made a, like a shadow box flag recently. Did, yes. Is that a similar concept That as didn't well? have dovetails in it, though. That didn't have dovetails. No. Could you use dovetails? I could. The inside had a, a triangle in there, and so the top would have been square, and the two ends would have been, you know, 45 degree-ish. Uh, they would have been the other direction, though. Um, but, yeah, you can do the same thing there. Yeah. So, Michael Dean, he has a video on what he made. What's that? So, I was letting him know that if he hasn't seen your video, you have one. Of the stool? No, the flag. Oh, yes. Well, both. <laughs> Make sure I get this line right. The more accurate your cuts are, the more accurate the rest of your work is going to be. Ooh, let's don't grab the angle. So, next we need to do, on the tailboard, I need to mark on the side of this. So I'm going to grab my unsquare, 
I'm going to put that on here. And for that, I'm going to put my knife into the line coming up, slide the square up against that. Oop, light, medium, hard. And then I'm going to make sure, oh, look at that, it does match the line all the way around. You do that on the other side too. And <laughs> put it right into to find that line. Oop. Well, that's not nice. <laughs> I'm going to go light, medium, hard, and make sure that it indeed oh, matched up all the way around. You didn't switch cameras. Oh. There. You see the line? <laughs> now, here's the next problem. Um, normally, I would put it in the vise, in a moxin vise or something like that, and I'd cut down this way. The problem is, I need this to lean away from me at 45 degrees because... My splay is, um, let me grab my dovetail saw. My splay is not going to be this way. My splay is going to be this way. So I need my saw to still be across this. And with it straight across there, then I'm gonna tilt the saw to cut it. This is, this is one of those points where it's one of those aha moments on the differences. So I don't want to cut I don't want to cut straight down this way. I want this to be at an angle this way so that when it's at an angle, then I can take the saw and I can turn it to my dovetail. So that means I'm actually going to pinch it in my vise like this with the top of this being at 45 degrees. I'm going to put it down just a little lower. Right there. So the top of this is flat, but the whole board is leaned at 45 degrees. And move this over here to get you a little better shot of what I'm doing. Any question while I'm setting that up? Uh, let's see. So, Raiden Mab Mabry, Mabry asked, is pin and pin on the same board easier than pin and tail on the same board? Wouldn't make a difference. Um, it just, it is more traditionally aesthetic pleasing to have when you look at one side, you see two tails, and you look at the other side, and you see two pins. Um, but you can make them every other all the way around. I mean, you could do the exact same thing on a drawer. Um, and with a reg regular box, there isn't any more stress one way or the other, so it really doesn't make any difference. So uh, now we need to lay out the dovetails. That means we're going to be pulling out the dividers, and I already have this one preset for what I want because I'm making it into a box. So I'm going to set this out here. There's the far side of the first one. Turn it around. Really thin over here big fat tails really small pins so just like traditional dovetails we're going to treat the top surface of this the exact same way we would treat let me grab a smaller one we we'll treat the exact same way we would treat this um, having this top surface flat with our work so this board is going to remain at the same angle that the box is at. If that makes sense. I'm sure that didn't though. <laughs> now, um, when I need to lay out lines going across the top, in that case, I can still use my square. I can set that on here, put this into here, slide that over, just resting it against the point. Come over to this one. One right beside it. Turn this around. I'm gonna grab one more. Oop, don't let it slide. Don't let it slide. Like that. Don't let it slide. <laughs> there. Now I'm gonna take my saw and I wanna cut on the outside of this because I'm keeping the tails here. Put it right on my mark. And I'm gonna start my kerf going straight across. Let me turn the camera over here so you can see. Here, sorry, switch back to that one. So you can actually see the cutting angle of it. Here, focus on that. There we go. That'll give you a little better angle, I hope. <laughs> so I'm going to start with this. I'm just going to create a curve all the way across. I'm not cutting in. And then I'm going to angle it at the angle I want. 
Now I'm not actually marking down this because I prefer to eyeball it. And whatever angle I would normally make my dovetails, I'm going to keep the exact same thing. So I'm doing about an 8 to 1-ish. Go down to my line on this side. Look around, make sure I'm good there. Just one pass more. I'm going to do the other tail. And then I'm going to go to the other side and lean the saw the other way. Start off making a kerf. Straight across, put the saw at the angle I want. Down to the line. Last far side of the other tail. Now one of the big concerns is that when you look at these, they don't look like they're eight to one dovetails. They look like they're really, really light angles. Because um, if I hold it up like this, those lines look almost parallel. You can see that they're a little bit fatter at the bottom, but if I lean it over so that you're actually looking in line with it, now they look a little bit better. Um, it's one of these optical illusions that when you have it at a weird angle, the tails never look like they're quite as wide as they should be. Now I'm going to cut off the end pieces on either end, so we can close this up. Any questions? Uh, let's see. Dwayne Rowan asked, what is the most difficult dovetail joint you've ever made? Um, sunrise dovetails, I think. Those are just really weird. We did those on Although, the live, uh, didn't we? Yeah, I've done the live on that. Um, Bohemian dovetails, those are, those are fun too. Now it's in my head. Mama mia, mama mia. <laughs> mama mia, let me Hey. Shh. Shh. Okay. <laughs> Before we move anywhere else, I grab a chisel. Clean up the schmoo that's in the corner. Under, have to clean that back out a little bit. Leaned over just a hair. There. Then we can flip it over and do the other side. And the one thing about this is you're always going to be moving. The last one I was cutting this way. Well, now I have to move over here and cut this direction because each one is at a different angle to the bench. Whereas with standard dovetails, you're always working at 90 so degrees to the bench. I have a question. What's that? So you know how like you look in the reflection of the saw when you're making a cut? Yeah. So do you want the reflection to be slanted or should well, it be straight up and down? When in this looking? case, the reflection doesn't work very well. Here, it doesn't me, work. Okay. I was wondering. A little bit closer on this. And see if we can see this. Because in here, if I put this, if I'm at 90 degrees, you can make, you can see how the board should continue through on the other side. And if I lean it over this way, it's going up. If I lean it this way, it's going down. But if I go at 45 degrees, now it's harder to tell if it's going up or down um, because there isn't as much of a reference to it. And so vertical this way is a little bit harder to reference. You can still use that, but I don't trust it as much when I'm off of 90 degrees. Okay. Because it's very easy to make it look like the board continues on to the other side of the board. But if you change it at an angle, now it's not continuing onto the board, it's continuing off into space. Just looks a little bit weird. Good question, though. I like having a wife who understands woodworking. Well, I was just thinking this would be an interesting thing. one to, for you to do live in the shop with a newbie. And I am a newbie, so I just asked my question <laughs> because that was going through my head. Set up another one of those. I don't have one of those on the docket right now. Okay, so we've done the outside. Now I need to remove the schmoo in between. 
Oh, 428. All right, got to speed up things up. I love having a little bit too much fun talking. Um, so I'm going to grab my hold fast that I put away. Lock this down on here. And tap that down. Now I'm going to be grabbing a small one because I made really little pins on here. And I'm going to grab joiner's mallet. And on this one, uh, it's going to be the exact same thing except for, again, rather than 90 degrees, it's just 45 degrees. Um, the nice thing about angled dovetails is it's going to be one of two angles. It's going to be either 90 degrees or it's going to be that other angle you set. It's always one or the other. It's never something that's wildly different. It's either this angle or this angle. Or most of the time it's something other than 45, so in which case it would be this angle or this angle. And let's move this back in here. There we go. Three. So let's set this on here. There's the line, and I'm going to eyeball 45 degrees. I'm going to move a little ways away from the line. I'm going to tap down. Now, the nice thing about this, because I'm going at that angle, everything pops right out. And I really don't have to do much of anything back because I'm going in at a weird angle. I can just continue on down. And I want to take it really close to the other side. Um, I, I want to do almost everything from this side. And I think that's about as far as I go. I'm probably about an eighth inch away from the other side. So now I'm going to put it right into that, that line. Run down it. And run down it. They're really, really easy from this side. Then, when I flip it over, things become really confusing. Let me do it from this side then. Because now, um, we're actually cutting against the grain. So anytime I'm pounding down into this, now it wants to follow the grain. So I'm going to stay, actually I'm going to start right on the line and I'm just going to score it just a tad, just a tad. Just because a tad. I want to have a line there that will pop to. I'm going to move away from the line a little ways. And I'm just going to break it off. You have a super chat, by the there. way. What's that? You have a super chat, by the oh, way. I do. What's the super chat? Uh, Braden Mabry says, in honor of more productivity. Which honor cracks me up. Well, thank you. Who's that? Braden? Braden. Because James is like probably one of the most productive people I know. <laughs> I, on the other hand, suffer from ADOS. Attention deficit, ooh, shiny. Okay, now, what I can do is I can put this in here, and I want to make sure it touches all the way along, and I don't. I have a big hump in the middle. So it's actually easier to do that from my side. Do we have a mom joke? I do. What do we got? What do a tick and the Eiffel Tower have in common? Tick? What? They're both Paris sites. Oh, <laughs> Paris sites. I like that one. That's a good one. I was afraid you would think of like the blue tick, the cartoon. That's in where I was. Going. I know that's where you went. <laughs> so, I know what generation you're from. <laughs> Here, Let's see if I can show you guys inside of this. Come over this way just a little more. There we go. So I'm actually just cleaning this up because I need to go back just a little bit more because I've gotten right to my line on the other side. Ooh. Right there. So that should be our tails. Let's check and make sure because I want to make sure just like with normal dovetails, you want to make sure that the inside space is 90 degrees. Well, because I'm going across the board, I don't want to square. I want to use my other square. I want to make sure that my bottom is 45 degrees. There are too many good jokes in that statement. Let's see from this side. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. 45 degrees, 45 degrees. Okay, there, our tails are done. Half the story. Now we need to transfer those over to this. Oh, you thought transferring measurements was hard without that. 
Well, I'm going to show you a slightly different trick that I like to do with angled dovetails. And every now and then, if I have a really weird regular dovetail, I'll still use it for that. Any questions while I set this up? So, Alex wants to know, why do you have so many clamps in the corner? Hey, you can never have enough clamps. Yeah, but you seem to have a different pile on the back. Oh, yeah, I need, I'm actually making these hand clamps. That's an upcoming video. Actually, I think that one's Saturday. I think that is Saturday's video. So you wouldn't see those. <laughs> so um, in this case, I need to take these because they need to go together. I need this one to slide into that one. Um, so I need to actually transfer that mark. And I find it easiest to put them in the vise and get them close, put a little bit of pressure on them, and then just tap them around until they're locked in place. It's a lot easier mark them then whoop, oh I thought I was showing that sorry lock them in the vise like this and now I can reach in line them up get them right where I want them tighten it down I want to make sure that I've got flat across here so this one needs to go down just a hair more whoop, just tapped it down too far Lining up is hard to do. There we go. There. So now that they're in place, now I can get my knife in here. And they're locked in really nice. So I can very easily get the marks I need transferred from one to the other. And I also need to remember, now I'm doing pins, not tails. So I need to be on the other side of the line, going in the other direction. Don't cut off the wrong side, which I actually did on my earlier set. Oops. <laughs> um, wait, which camera do you think you're doing? The main one. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. There sorry, we go. when you do little detailed work and I'm trying to reply in the chat and I look up, I'm like, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I showed the that one earlier. Just making so sure. We've got our lines transferred onto this one. And so just as before, this gets locked in here at 45 degrees, just like that. So we're going to make our cuts in this. But in this one, rather than leaning the saw this way, we're going to still keep it vertical this way, but we're going to turn it this way. Exactly the same as if we were doing the ingrain dovetail this way. We would turn it that way on there. We do the same thing on this. Now, I can come in with this and draw these lines, though they're not as easy because I'm kind of resting it against a 45 degree. I still can draw a vertical line from here for me okay. to follow. Did I miss how you were doing the spacing? Are you just doing the spacing? following the line that you made earlier down hmm? on that face, the line you just made? On this face? Yeah. Oh, the spacing is the, the marks I have on top here that I just transferred. That's what I'm saying. You're just transferring Yeah, so I'm taking down. this okay. point here and making it down. I want it to be parallel to this outside or square to this edge right here. So I can put this on here and do that. Gotcha. Um, it's just a little harder to hold in place because it's resting on an obtuse angle rather than straight across 90 degree face. So while you're doing that, Braden Mabry wants to know, is pin size the tail size very important for strength-wise, or is it all aesthetics? It, it's, it's 85 to 90% aesthetics. Um, it is better to have the tails a little bit bigger than the pins, um, but not that much. Um, it, it's mostly aesthetics. Though you'll have a lot of gurus out there that tell you, no, you've got to have this proportion and this size. No, it's, it's aesthetics. There might be ever so slight differences, but not enough that would make a difference. Need my thinner Oop. square to get in here. Line. Oop, don't turn. Straight lines, not curved lines. Curved lines don't work as well. And these lines are more or less there to... I want to see where I'm going. Now, before I go any farther, this is the most important thing. If you learn only one thing from this whole thing, it's grab a Sharpie, come in here, 
and mark what you are getting rid of. <laughs> getting rid of this and this and this. You want to cut on that side of the line. Yeah, don't look at my earlier ones. So I'm going to come over here, just like before. I'm going to start a kerf. And I'm going to let it run down that line. Down to the line there. Oop, right side of the line, right side of the line. Almost cut on the wrong side again. Now we're going to turn and go this way. Is that another super chat? Ah, uh, yes it is. It just popped up. I heard the light going behind me. <laughs> what has he got? Troy J says, Sarah's going to need a lot of hot chocolate tonight. <laughs> Yeah, and if you guys knew the hours that she's been pulling at the hospital lately. <laughs> In two days. <laughs> yeah, she did, uh, was it 15 hours yesterday and 11 oh. hours today? Or no, it was yeah, almost 11 hours today. Yeah, they, they were long days. There's still three more days in this week. I know. All right. Can we finish this one? Okay, what's we got? So, oh, since Troy super chatted, he asked, can the focus be shifted to the wood instead of the vise? Um, oh, is it off? Oh, sorry. Um, there, is that better? But are you ready for my uh, mom joke? <laughs> yes. How do you follow Will Smith in the snow? How do you follow a Smith in no. the snow? No, how do you follow Will Smith in the snow? Um, oh, there's a 90s joke in this somewhere. What is it? You follow the fresh prints. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going down the line of trying to get jiggy with it. <laughs> that was the joke from Thursday's video. So. Okay, um, yes, let's do this. So... I'm going to move it over this way so you guys can see. And on this one, I can get a bigger chisel. I'm actually going to move up to my half inch, which is right here. And for this, this is the slow part. And you could do this with a, uh, with a coping saw. Um, but, man, that would, be, that would be weird just cutting at 45 degrees. It would be a lot more material because it's a thicker cut. Focus. There it goes. And so just like before, I'm going to go away from my line. Actually, I'm going to need to do something different for this one. Otherwise, it's going to rotate on me. Um, here. Oh, let's do it this way. What I can do is I can grab a dumb block. Put that over here. Grab a hold fast from the other side. And I can lock that one down. Let's go halfway in between the two. Like that. Most of woodworking is just about finding a way to hold it. Lock that one first. Then I can lock this one without moving. Oh, that's right. This is the one's bent. I need to twist that one back. It's like, why is it not going right? There. That's better. There we go. So now, I can chisel into this one without moving. Without it moving. Without it moving. <laughs> Why is that one rotating that much? Huh. Oh, because that came loose. Is that? Oh, that's the old hole. Eh. Let's see Are if I you can doing do okay over there? <laughs> I'm having a hard time right now. <laughs> can I throw a question at yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, throw a question that? in here while I figure out what, <laughs> okay. what I'm doing. John Hayes wants to know, do you get any ideas from Japanese joints? Um, not really. 
Japanese joints and Western joints are the exact same thing. They're just Japanese joints tend to take multiple joints and mix them together. So you get a half lap in with a mortise and a dovetail and um, it's just multiple joints all done at once in one spot. Um, it's, it's all the exact same things, just done in a different way. So I'm actually going to do this in the vise. And I know there's a whole subset of people out there who went, oh, you're chopping in a vise. Yes, I'm chopping in a vise. Um, and in this one, it's a little bit dangerous because I'm chopping through something that's a little thinner. But it shouldn't be a problem because my chisel is sharp, right? Um, I don't know, yeah. is it sharper? You have a knack of using dull tools on the wives. <laughs> <laughs> so once I get down in there, actually I can come back this way. And always chisel away from yours. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We need a disclaimer. No, and I, I get that question quite a bit with the Japanese joints, is that Japanese joinery is joinery. Uh, whether it's Japanese or Western, it's still joinery. It's the exact same thing, just uh, different ways of looking at it. I want to be very careful. I don't want to go all the way through it, but I want to do most of it from this side because this is the side where I'm going with the grain. On the other side, I'm going against the grain and it's a bit of a pain. Here, let me go this way. Get rid of the excess chips. So I'm getting close to the point where I don't want to blow through. So I'm going to come over and do this one. This is where hand tools remind me of power tools because my mallet is really close to my microphone. <laughs> and this is a part that I really enjoy. Just this chopping is so much fun. Um, I, at least I find it fun. Um, anytime I can grab a mallet and a chisel and I can go to town, is a time that I am very happy. Okay, we're getting close to it. So now I'm going to come back into that line. Oop, into the line. I'm just eyeballing 45. I'm going to come back and clean it up a little bit later. Is that your half inch chisel? What's that? Is that your half inch? Yes. Narex Richter. I was like, that's usually your go-to, so. A half inch is just that, that perfect size that tends to fit everything. It's used more than anything else in the shop. Okay, there we go. Now, let's open this up. Without wrapping all my cables up in it, flip it over. And on this side, I'm going against the grain, so I need to be very, very, very careful with what I do. Because it will want to suck it down in. So, oh, what's the little bitty one? Is that an, an eighth? Um, I was using a quarter inch. Quarter. Okay. Um, but now I'm using the half. I have an eighth, but I don't use the eighth much. The eighth is one of those chisels that's kind of interesting because you you never it's very rare that you need an eighth inch chisel. But every now and then, the project comes up where you need an eighth inch chisel because a quarter inch won't fit into the gap. So you need something that's thinner. It's one of the rare times when you actually need that tool to make it happen. I mean, you could theoretically come in with a saw and use it kind of like in some cases, in other cases you can't. Um, but it's one of those really weird things that most every other tool in the shop, you can substitute with something else. But with a chisel, when it gets smaller, occasionally there's absolutely nothing else that'll do it but that chisel. It's one of those kind of cool things. It's, it's a necessary tool. 
which is weird. Sorry, I got an eyelash that's driving me bonkers. I rubbed it, and there, got it. <laughs> so I'm staying a little ways away from my line. And I'm also going to come at it at 90 degrees to the board because I want to score it so when it breaks off, it breaks off at this mark, which is a little ways away from the line. Because it's going to break, it's not something I can easily clean off. So now that I have that in, I'm going to chisel back to it. Chisel back to it again. I fix that. Let's do this one again. I'm going to come in again at 90 degrees. There, that one snapped. And I'm trying to get it to break, but I want it to break away from the line rather than breaking on the line. So let's do this one again. There. So now, now I want to go into the line, which is, wait a second, make sure I'm looking at that right. So I've got a missed scratch line on there. I'll make sure it's actually square. All right, yep, that's what I was wanting. Good. <laughs> Double check the line. Actually, because it cuts through some blue tape, I'm actually going to remove that blue tape so that I can see it. And this is the point at which I start to speed things up and I try to get faster. And this is the point that I really need to be slowing down to make sure it is done right. Because at this point, this is where all the details come. This is where gaps show up. Gaps don't come up in your sawing, unless you saw on the wrong side of the line. Gaps almost always come up in the chisel work. So now that I have that done, I come right in and I'm still going at 90 degrees. So I'm still trying to save those fibers. Oop. Tighten it down just a hair more. And then we can flip it over and trim it right down to that line. There. So now we've got all this excess junk in there. Here, lift that up a little bit more, sorry. Got all that excess junk in there we want to get rid of. So now I'm going to put it at 45 degrees, parallel to the bench, and I can come in with the chisel. So we've had some down. people join that were on at the very beginning. Uh -huh. um, did you specify what kind of projects you you'd use this particular joint for? Um, anywhere where you want to dovetail at an angle. <laughs> um, I have used it in step stools, or one step stool, um, and boxes are the two big things where I use it the most. Uh, it's kind of rare that you have an angled drawer, but every now and then they come up. Um, but anytime you want to join two things at an angle and you want them to be structural, this is a good joint for it. So anytime you want to take two boards and you want to join them this way, you would think dovetail. Well, anytime you want to join them this way, you think angled dovetail. Um, that's pretty much where it would come from. Now, let me check with this. Make sure a little bit more in that corner. And this is where the fiddly comes in. And this is where I should be slowing down, taking my time, making sure I'm taking a little shaving after a little shaving. Let me switch it back to this camera because I'm basically 
just trimming it up, making sure this is flush and flat on the bottom. I could come in with a file at this point. Questions? Mm -mm. No questions? Oh, oh nope, I lied. I'm sorry. <laughs> Brandon Mabry asked, could you use the dog holes on your vise to hold it instead of the jaws when you were doing that earlier? Um, the dog holes on my vise? Um, yes. Yeah, I probably could pinch it between those. I've just gotten so used to doing things in my vise that I actually kind of like it. I don't know why, but that really annoys some people. Um, but uh, sorry, <laughs> I actually like working in my vice or chopping in my vice. But do you follow your own advice? No. <laughs> so Sumi asked, know. how much more difficult is an angled? Half blind dovetail. Um, just say making sure. Good there, there. Good. Um, it's not that much more than a regular half blind dovetail. I was actually originally thinking about doing that with the box and having half blind dovetails, um, but then decided against it. Um, not because it would be more difficult, but more because I like the aesthetic. Um, I've actually never done, have I? I don't think I've ever done an angled half blind, but it really shouldn't be any more work. Um, now actually it should be a little bit less because you already, you're taking out more material on an acute angle. Um, so it should be actually a little bit easier to do than a standard one. Just going to use a file here to clean up any schmoo. Any little bits that are sticking up. Anything that's obviously out of line. And then, make sure I get this right. I have number three. Number three. Okay, moment of truth. Do they actually work? Probably not. It's rare that things work on okay, the first Okay, you gotta hit the button. Oops, sorry. Make sure three and three up and up. Let me look at it from this side. Oh, duh. <laughs> I'm like, that is too fat to go in there. It needs to go in this way, not this way. <laughs> I was really off and I was getting scared. <laughs> so let's see what we get. It just takes a little bit of wiggling because you have to get all the points on there. And then it should just slide together. It's not quite going down all the way here, so it's not stopping there, so I need to take that down a little bit deeper. You can see a, a little bit of a gap here because I need to take off more material at this point. So let's just do that. So I'm gonna put this in here, go back to what I was just doing, trim this off a little bit more right at the point. So I want to keep this line where it is and then take this back edge down just a hair farther. Any other questions? Um. I'm just eyeballing how much I'm taking off. So Margaret Altvader, Altvader um, asked, which tail vise would you recommend on, other than the twin turbo vise? Um, I like anything with a twin screw. Um, the Hovarder makes a really great one. Um, then there's, um, oh, come on, A makes the, the plexiglass with the geared vise. Um, someone will put it in the chat here in a moment. Drive me bonkers, I can't remember his name now. Um, that's the one, if I, if I could have any one, that would be the one I'd have. Um, this, well, yeah, this, that's the twin turbo. Um, that would be my, my all-time favorite. This one is actually a Veritas twin screw. Um, the one on Sarah's is a, uh, uh, a cheap um, single screw, but with a double rail that actually works pretty well. 
Hey, I like it. It's not 100% there. I got a little more detail to do on it, but that's about it. So there you go. Got to do just a little bit more work to work it down in there farther. Got to take off just a hair more that I was just doing. But other than that, that's right about it. And I left these a good bit thicker than they, than they are because I'm going to come back through and plane everything smooth so any scratches and, and uh, issues on the outside um, aren't as much. So I'll put this side together and show you what it looks like. This is the one I have a huge gap on. I cut on the wrong side of the line, but oh well. Oh, come on. Go in there. So I've got a bunch of these still to do. This is the third one. Yeah, this is the one I cut on the wrong side of the line. Look at that gap. Isn't that pretty? Here. I'll zoom in on that gap so you can really see it. Look at that. Isn't that a pretty gap? That's a nice one. That one looks a lot better. I like that one. So the box will look like that on either end and then dovetails coming together. I'm kind of interested to see how this will, this will all come out. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. So there you go, angled dovetail. Um, it's one of those that do it once or twice and it will just suddenly click and it becomes, it's the exact same thing as a regular dovetail. It really is absolutely no different at all once you wrap your brain around the few different things of rather than using this for both directions, you use this in one direction and this in the other direction and that's really the only difference. Um, you know, there's some more work holding and the actual, um, you know, how do you hold it in place, how do you transfer the marks. Um, it's a little different, but everything else about it is the exact same once you wrap your brain around it, which is kind of one of those fun things of, oh, oh yeah, I, I love it when those things click. So, yeah, um, what, uh, any last minute questions? Yes, so, yeah. um, so LT asked, how would you clamp them? I how would I clamp them? Oh, yeah, the octagon is actually going to be an interesting one. Um, and I'm actually just going to put two clamps on. So I have an octagonal box, and I have one that goes from this face to this face, and I have one clamp that goes from this face to this face. And because they all slide together, those two faces will squeeze the whole thing in. And so with those two pressure points, you can circle it down. Um, for If I were to do a pentagonal, that would require a good bit more. Um, I may end up coming in with strap clamps um, and then putting on cleats. Um, so I'd put a cleat on the flat face, so across here, so that the high point would be in the middle of the board rather than the corners. Um, so if I put a cleat here, which is a cleat, uh, let me grab a scrap of something. Uh, oh, come on, scrap, there we go. So I grab a scrap of something like this and put it on there, so this would be the high point. And when I wrapped a strap clamp around this, then it would be pushing this in. So if I had multiple faces, um, that would be a really easy way to do it, and I could just take that ratcheting strap clamp and suck the whole thing in. What's next? Uh, let's see, last question. Sumi wants to know, he's working a new workbench, looking at the end vise, advice between the Yoast single screw versus a Veritas twin screw. Um, the Veritas is just going to be more stable. Uh, there, there's, no, there's absolutely no racking in this. I mean, if, if there's racking from one end to the other across 20 inches, I might have an eighth inch of racking if I really cramp it down on one side. Um, having a twin screw just gives you so much more stability. Um, the downside to it is you can't clamp tapered items. Um, it, it's, it's somewhat uh, limiting on that. Um, whereas with the, the, the single screw, um, you can actually put a bit of a taper in there and twist it back and forth, um, even with the, the stabilizing rods. Um, for average day-to-day, -day, it doesn't make that big a difference, um, especially if you're, you get good and quick at using an anti-racking device um, that will make it work just as good as anything else. Um, and I basically run mine like a single screw um, because I only have one rod in here. Let me back this up so you can actually see the mess on my floor as well. So there we go. I run mine with just the one. I never have anything in this. So even if I'm clamping something over on this side, I'm still just using this one because the chain runs both of them. You know, technically I should have it, but then they'd be banging into each other all the time. Um, so I like to just run it with, with one, um, one rod.
But I'm looking forward to seeing your bench. That should be a fun one. Anything else? I'm calling it a night. We're going to call it a night then. <laughs> this has been a fun one. Um, and I've got a few more of these to come up. So this will be a video coming out probably two, three weeks. So it should be a, a fun one. I'm making a, uh, a first aid kit with an octagonal box. And that's for the first aid kit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know what I have coming up next week. I think, um, well, yeah, we'll see. If you have any ideas, something you'd like to see me do, then throw that on the comments and uh, maybe I'll do it. So I think it'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.